I'd like to begin with a question. If a train leaves Chicago, <laughs> heading due west at 50 miles an hour, and at that moment, another train, 200 miles to the east, begins leaving its station, also heading due west, at 65 miles an hour, then what percentage of you are experiencing buttocks-clenching terror at the prospect of doing an algebra problem? Uh-huh. Yeah. I thought so. I've seen those facial expressions before. When I would walk into my algebra class, and I'd see some students, and they look like me, stoked, because we're going to do some math. But most of them, most of them looked a bit like you did a minute ago. They looked like they were here for a different class entirely. Um, Root Canals 101, or <laughs> Intro to Being Draped in Poisonous Snakes. So I would tell them this story. I would say, within these walls, we are mathematicians with a long and glorious lineage, stretching all the way back to ancient Greece and beyond. And I want to tell you about one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, Archimedes. In about 200 BC, Archimedes was an old man, retired in his hometown of Syracuse, when the Romans lay siege to the city. Now, Archimedes was also an inventor, and he had supplied the armory of Syracuse with numerous ingenious devices for defense. And so with his help, the city withstood the attack for the better part of a year. But one night, the Roman soldiers breached the defenses and scaled the city walls, and they came looking for him. And on that night, like any other night, Archimedes was at home doing mathematics. He kept a tray of sand in which he would draw diagrams to focus his mind. Lines, angles, circles. Roman soldiers burst into his house, kicking down the door, leveling their swords at him, and demanding that he surrender. But Archimedes wasn't done with his problem, so he stood beside it, and he said, take care not to disturb my circles. So they killed him. And I would tell my students this so they would know, yes, it is true. On occasion, doing mathematics can lead directly to your death. <laughs> but it is historically very rare so relax. <laughs> Mathematics is the art of solving problems, but it is also the art of attaining the mental state necessary in which to do so. We might be in class hand computing the factors of polynomials, and a student would come up to me, and they'd ask me a question, and you already know the question. When am I ever going to use this? <laughs> and what I like to do is say, you probably won't. And then watch them get really hopeful while they thought about maybe they could drop this class. However, I'd say, <laughs> mathematics is the art of solving problems by breaking complicated problems into simpler problems. And if those problems are complex, breaking them into simpler problems still. And you will have problems until the day that you die. <laughs> You may be thinking, I'm not good at math. And you know what? You're right. <laughs> but that's because you're a human. Humans are terrible at math. Think about it. We're plains apes who have learned to wear pants. <laughs> it's a miracle we can do any computations at all. Math demands that we make complex mental manipulations of abstract concepts. But we're doing that abstract work in a human body, with human instincts. And those instincts are telling you, do not go into the unknown, it is probably full of snakes. I'm not going to try a problem I've never solved before, because if I try, I might fail. And if I fail, I risk social shame. I will be ejected from the tribe, where I will die all alone. <laughs> Math. The fear is natural. We just need to learn how to not panic. 
And what I recommend for situations like this is feeling your body, taking a nice cleansing breath. So from now on, when you hear a terrifying math word, just remember you can always take a nice cleansing breath. Let's try it together. <laughs> Algebra. <sighs> Polynomial. <sighs> Trigonometric function. <sighs> We're fine. Our buttocks are relaxed. <laughs> it's okay. And now let's try it while I demonstrate a math problem for you. It's perfectly safe. I'm a trained professional. <laughs> 427 minus 30. Oh God, we'll have to borrow. <sighs> we don't have to borrow. Borrow is a good algorithm, but it requires pencil and paper. I have neither. We need to break the problem apart, though. So, 427 minus 30. Well, 30 is pretty close to 27. It's, it's 27 with three left over. So we can think about the problem as 427 minus 27 and minus three. 427 minus 27, that's 400. 400 minus three, that's 397. Is that, is that right, 397? <laughs> okay, good, you have to check, that's the last step. And so, I have shown you the steps. Step one, get control of your body. Step two, break the problem apart, make a plan. Step three, execute that plan. And step four, verify your result. It's very simple, usually. Frequently, sometimes, Almost never, because if you've never seen a kind of problem before, then it is not at all obvious where to break it apart. And if you do not see how to break it apart, then you cannot move forward, and then you become stuck. Stuck? I don't like that word. It's innocuous. Frozen. Powerless. No ideas alone in an empty void of your blank page. All of the blood runs out of your head and into your feet and you pass out. You slide beneath your desk, but when you wake up, the problem is still there. <laughs> and this is when people give up. Not on 427 minus whatever. They give up on math entirely. They think, no more numbers, no more shapes. I'm not a math person. I'll leave that to experts, and I'll believe them. If I were a math person, I wouldn't be stuck. I wouldn't be struggling. I wouldn't be suffering. Who do I look like? Einstein? Let's talk about Einstein and suffering. Einstein had great compassion for the suffering of others. He was very imaginative. And that imagination served him well in his scientific work, but it also let him imagine what it must be like to be someone else. When Marie Curie was receiving bags of hate mail, he wrote her a letter telling her, these people are reptiles and they are writing you hogwash. In his adopted home of the United States, he observed that African Americans here were treated quite like Einstein himself, a Jew, had been treated in pre-Nazi Germany. So he took the time to travel to Lincoln University, a black college, where he lectured, and he said, racism is a disease of white people, and I do not intend to be quiet about it. And he addressed intellectual suffering when he said, do not worry about your difficulties in mathematics. I can assure you, mine are still greater. Now, he wasn't pulling rank. He was saying that if you're struggling with, let's say, subtraction, and you cannot understand for the life of you why on earth it should be that the minus of a minus is a plus, and you're suffering, <laughs> that suffering was not unlike the suffering that Einstein went through while struggling with his problems. 
Now, he'd already struggled through arithmetic. His problems were the geometry of space-time. How is it that space and time change and flow in response to gravitation? And that requires some heavy mathematical machinery. Things with names like diffeomorphic covariance, and tensor product, and Lorenz manifold. I have troubles with mathematics. I have difficulties. And my difficulties will continue. This week, I spent two hours reading four pages of information theory. And most of the time, I looked like this. <laughs> the good news is, it never gets easier. You just get harder problems. I have spent hundreds of hours stuck over the years, and I became afraid. I became afraid that my mathematical journey was over, that I had reached the limits of my ape brain. But I stayed beside the problem. Because above all, mathematics has taught me to tolerate frustration and even enjoy it. I love doing math. I suffer, but I love it. And when I'm stuck, I zoom in. If a paragraph is too hard, I concentrate on one sentence. And if I can't make it through that sentence, I try to understand one word with focus. If I'm stuck and I cannot move forward, maybe I can move to the side. Maybe I can solve a related problem, get some leverage. And if I'm really, really stuck, and I'm turning the problem over, looking for a weakness, and I cannot find one, then I make my own weakness. I write down a huge error, something nice and wrong. <laughs> Because if something's wrong, it's wrong for a reason. Errors are information. Do you cook? then you've burned things. <laughs> And that burning smell is telling you, maybe next time, turn the heat down a little. Take it out of the oven a couple minutes earlier. <laughs> have you studied a musical instrument? Then you have experience holding a device that will give you instantaneous, unambiguous, and embarrassing feedback about how much you suck. <laughs> But those wrong notes are telling you something. They're saying, adjust your hands, do something different with your embouchure. <laughs> And over time, if you persist, you will sound less bad. <laughs> And mathematics is no different. Errors are information, learn to love them. And problems build the student. We have problems. Our problems will continue. Fortunately, our problems will only continue until we are dead. <laughs> so until then, we may as well confront them. We may as well embrace our fears, make friends with our errors, and trace the outlines of our problems in the sand. There will be struggling and there will be suffering. And there is no guarantee that the city will not fall. It may come to pass that our problems will overwhelm us, that they will defeat our most ingenious devices, that they will breach our walls and break down our doors and threaten us with death on the point of a sword. But by that point, we will have done our homework. We will have made our hundreds and thousands of mistakes. We will take a deep breath, and we will not be afraid. 